right, we can get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining. My name is Lexi and my pronouns are she, her. I'm currently a research coordinator at Johns Hopkins University in Maryland, um, but I've been a part of this task force for going on four years now. I'm really happy to be here um, and very excited to see you all. Um, next slide. Before we get started, uh, we wanted to take the time to do a land acknowledgement. Um, to create this, we took inspiration from WPSR's acknowledgement as well as the Housing Alliance acknowledgement. Um, so we respectfully acknowledge that we live, work, and learn on the occupied and unceded lands of the 29 federally recognized tribes of Washington state, plus many more unacknowledged people groups, including the Duwamish, whose ancestral land is home to our WPSR offices. These tribes and peoples have cared for these lands and waters since time immemorial. And we recognize that this land was wrongfully and violently taken from indigenous peoples. And we acknowledge the systemic exploitation and oppression of native peoples, enslaved Africans, and other historically underinvested groups, which has led to today's inequities in housing, health, and more. To acknowledge this history is to honor the land itself and the enduring presence of the indigenous peoples whose spiritual and cultural practices remain deeply connected to it. We commit to learning from and following the leadership of indigenous mm -hmm. elders, past and present, and to working towards atonement and long overdue reconciliation. We encourage you to join us in this learning and in the collaborative work of undoing the harms caused by racism and oppression. Together, let us strive for racial equity, housing justice, and a future where all of us belong. Next slide. Um, so yeah, that was um, our land acknowledgement. Just a bit about us before we get started. At WPSR, or Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, we're an advocacy organization working to create healthy, just, peaceful, and sustainable world. And to tackle this, we generally leverage the voice of health professionals and those passionate about our work to look upstream, educate the public, influence decision makers, and promote policies that support our mission. We focus on three of the greatest threats to human health, and these include nuclear weapons, the climate crisis, and the economic and racial inequity um, through our three task forces. Tonight's event was put together by the Economic Inequity and Health Task Force, um, and we focus on passing state policies that address main drivers of ill health including racial and economic inequity. Before we jump in, I'd like to thank my fellow committee members, Lily Deerwater, Charles Mayer, Anya Lewin, and Gleb Sitch. Next slide. So as this is our fourth um, annual housing and health event, I wanted to connect us to the previous years. Um, basically our focus on housing stems from the need to highlight the profound health impacts of being unhoused. As many, I'm sure you know, um, the death rate for individuals experiencing homelessness is two to five times higher than for those with stable housing. And access to housing not only improves physical and mental health, but it also reduces hospitalizations and overall healthcare costs. Those of us who have worked directly with individuals experiencing homelessness or housing insecurity understand that this issue is rooted in various systemic challenges, such as economic inequities and the shortage of affordable housing. Um, and so over the past three years, these underlying causes have been the focus of our efforts through these events. But with that being said, extensive scientific research shows that to truly address this complex problem, we have to address its root causes through upstream solutions, such as community-based and policy-driven change. So this year, we aim to showcase policies and programs that have already demonstrated success in making a positive impact in addressing homelessness. Next slide. We also wanted to ground this event with the voices of those who are most impacted. Um, so with that, I present a poem published by the ACLU of Washington, and it's a poem written by Morgan Sandys, who's a writer, a social worker, paralegal, and an advocate for the unhoused, who has also experienced housing insecurity herself. This poem is called Somewhere to Exist by Morgan Sandys. Tell us of the places left when shelters fill each day, 
Where else but in public spaces can our ad hoc homes remain? How can you tell us where to go, but never where to stay? Seems we're see-through when it suits you, but just as quick, we're in your way. Tell us of the places that we ought to go instead while we wait our turn for housing. Should we vanish or play dead? When you're faced with human suffering, do you act or turn your head? And if you don't want to see us, we need services and beds. Tell us of the places safe from being towed or swept. How can we rebuild our lives with that ever-looming threat? Constant shuffling does nothing to get us off the streets, and yet we're out of view to ease your conscience that our basic needs aren't met. So tell us of the places that we're always seem to miss. Tell us of these places, if you can find them or desist. Just tell us where this place is, so we'll at last unclench our fists or stop working to displace us. We need somewhere to exist. With that, I wanna thank you so much um, to each and every one of you for being here. We hope that this presentation is impactful and informative, and we hope that you'll join us um, in helping build um, a healthier future for all. I'll now hand it off to Anya who present our esteemed panelists. Thanks so much, Lexi, for that great kickoff of the event and the wonderful grounding opening. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anya Lewin. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm based at the University of Washington in the Department of Global Health, and I'm another newer member of the task force, so I'm going to be moderating the event tonight. Um, we have a fantastic speaker lineup, so we'll dive in shortly, but I just wanted to note a few things for logistics. There will be a short five minute Q&A after each speaker concludes their presentation. So in the meantime, while they're presenting, I ask that you please enter any questions into the chat box and I will make sure that um, we can answer as many of those as possible. Um, yeah. So now to the speakers. First up, I am excited to introduce Daniel Malone. Daniel Malone is the executive director of DESC, a nonprofit organization in Seattle providing survival and crisis services, behavioral health care, and permanent supportive housing. Daniel has been at DESC for the past 35 years, serving as executive director for the past nine years. A major emphasis of Daniel's work has been designing, implementing, and evaluating programs for adults experiencing chronic homelessness and living with complicated behavioral health disabilities and other conditions. He has provided technical assistance and presentations to groups around the U.S. and Canada and is co-convener of the National Housing First Partners Conference. Daniel holds an undergraduate degree from Boston College and a Master of Public Health degree from the University of Washington. So with that, I would love to hand it over to you, Daniel. Thank you very much, Anya. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thanks so much for having me at your event and for all of the work you all do with um, your various efforts to make our world and community a better place. Um, <clears throat> Lily, thank you for showing my slides. You can go to the next one. So I'm with this nonprofit organization in Seattle called DESC. It stands for Downtown Emergency Service Center, but we mostly just use the initials DESC, uh, we provide an array of services uh, aimed at helping meet the needs of people experiencing long-term homelessness and with a real uh, priority for people living with serious psychiatric conditions and co-occurring substance use disorder. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the, the main things uh, that define our work are, or our work is defined in a few main areas. So we provide survival services like shelters and uh, emergency housing. That's the first kind of work we ever got into 45 years ago. And we still do some of that kind of service because so many people still need it. We have become a significant outpatient behavioral health treatment provider um, doing outpatient mental health and substance use disorder treatment services. We um, are also a significant operator of behavioral health crisis response services uh, across King County. And then a major part of our work and what I'm mostly going to be talking about tonight is permanent supportive housing. This is a specialized kind of rental housing uh, that is designed to meet the needs of people with really 
complex uh, situations and uh, uh, complicated conditions who need more support to be successful in housing. Uh, next, please. Um, supportive housing as we operate it tends to look something like this, apartment buildings. We we develop, own, and operate these kinds of facilities. Um, it's basic rental housing with studio apartments. And um, then there's an array of services that are provided on site, and that includes 24-7 staffing to help be there for people when they need us. Um, so next slide, please. Let me tell you just a little bit more about the population that we prioritize our services to. Um, it's adults with... Um, <clears throat> Uh, serious mental illness, co-occurring substance use disorder, their experiences tend to be having um, been housing unstable for the bulk of their adult lives, really. Um, so on the streets and shelters, in and out of institutional care, um, people are who are highly vulnerable and often um, struggle to get by on their own without a lot of support. Um, Along the way, they tend to have a significant amount of involvement with um, crisis systems, including the legal system, jails, and so forth, um, uh, uh, hospital emergency departments, and other forms of the crisis system, and then uh, inpatient psychiatric services. Next, please. Um, so what we found over the years is that while the population that we've chosen to serve needs a lot of support in a lot of different ways, there's nothing they need more than a stable place to live. And we have uh, been uh, involved in the movement to create housing for people as the first thing that we try to provide them. It's uh, a movement known as Housing First. Um, and uh, what you can see here with the photos is just, um, uh, it's regular looking rental housing, furnished, of course, because people don't usually have their own resources for that kind of thing. Next slide, please. Housing first basically means that um, housing is a foundation that everybody has a need for, and it ought to be considered a right, not as something to hold out until people are more ready for it. And um, that housing is the the very thing that allows people to stabilize and benefit from other kinds of support that they might get, such as treatment. Next slide. Um, so uh, the way it really works is that you identify people who have the need for this kind of support, and you don't put other barriers in their way to give them access to it. So you bring people into housing without preconditions. But it's not just housing. Um, you don't stop there. You then bring the array of services that people need in order to be successful, but you make their participation in those services voluntary. Our clients have a lot of experience with uh, coercive kinds of uh, programs that haven't often done uh, a trick for them. Next, please. <clears throat> um, so what I want to focus on, though, is what happens when you provide this kind of thing to people. Um, and if you'll consider for a moment that this is a group of people who are often thought of by the general public and others as, um, as really unready for housing, that uh, they need to have their other problems fixed before they can become housed, or in some people's minds uh, that they... Uh, aren't interested in housing. And what we have found through a variety of different evaluations and research studies we've participated in, that, and you can find uh, links to uh, at this URL at the bottom of the slide there, um, is that in fact, uh, people do want this kind of housing intervention. Um, they accept it when they won't accept other kinds of essentially treatment first kinds of interventions. Um, that people, it, it resolves their homelessness. People move into this kind of housing and very few of them return to homelessness afterward. Um, and along the way then, all kinds of other things get better in people's lives. They stop having near, nearly as many crisis events. Um, they start to show signs of improved health in various ways that includes reductions in substance use and the problems associated with substance use. 
Um, they get in trouble less often with the law. And it provides this platform for people to sort of reconnect to the to the life of the broader community. Uh, next slide, a little more uh, specificity on some of these outcomes include uh, some studies we, we did about people who were high users of crisis services, who then we brought into supportive housing and they read, which they readily accepted, um, is that um, when you look at this group and compare them to a group of similar people who didn't get the housing intervention, um, you see that people had much lower uh, use and therefore expense related to their use of these publicly funded crisis uh, services. Um, next shows um, kind of how this breaks down, that um, there were much lower use of uh, Medicaid spending on this population group because they weren't going to the hospital with injuries nearly as much. Um, they were getting booked into jail uh, much less often, and they were using other kinds of places that they might be staying in much less often. Uh, next, please. Um, so these kinds of results and and other results that were being um, produced elsewhere by other providers doing similar work resulted in a lot of adoption of housing first as a policy priority around the country. And so, you know, John Oliver covered it in one of their episodes. Um, it's been written about favorably in lots of different publications around the country as, you know, the sort of simple uh, way to address chronic homelessness is to provide housing to people. You know, who would have thought? Um, next, please. Um, we continue to build off of that. Um, we have 17 of, this, of these kinds of facilities around Seattle and King County. Um, these types of apartment buildings that are two newest ones are shown in the photos on these uh, particular slides here. Um, uh, but things aren't always uh, smooth sailing. So next slide, please. Uh, there are a lot of challenges we're facing right now. Um, it's always been difficult work despite all those positive research outcomes that I mentioned earlier. Um, it's always been hard. Uh, we need a lot of uh, staff to provide support to people who have really high needs and need a fair amount of, uh, you know, people around them to help them uh, be successful. Uh, more recently, those that's become even more complicated. And uh, there are several main areas of that. And that includes that the population overall is getting older and coming with that are more medical complications and um, uh, are the need for us to provide more uh, uh, services to people where they live because many of them are not uh, adept at using conventional medical systems or they're often not very welcome in those kinds of conventional systems. Um, and then also more recently is that um, the drug supply that is that exists in the community um, uh, has taken a turn into one where uh, there's a much greater risk of sudden death um, because um, the, the drug supply is toxic with fentanyl be basically being in everything. And so that's produced a lot more drug overdose events, public drug use, as everyone can observe, and that has complicated both people's lives and day-to-day -day realities, but also um, has... Uh, uh, inform the public discourse, I think, in often negative ways. And then last slide, please. That has led to um, a backlash against Housing First. Uh, there has been a concerted effort by uh, interests on the right to um, call out Housing First as something to be attacked. Um, this is, it's featured in Project 2025 that I'm sure we've all heard about. Um, as something that is uh, needs to be dismantled. Um, and the key arguments against Housing First in, for, um, in a lot of this uh, propaganda, as I would call it, um, are that, look, Housing First was a priority, but homelessness got worse. Therefore, Housing First must be the problem with that, um, which, of course, ignores the um, the fact that uh, people who, who get housing first interventions are actually successful. It's the people who don't get it are the ones that are on the streets. Um, and and uh, um, there isn't much in place to stop people from falling into homelessness in the first place. Um, and then 
Um, because this is a high needs population, some of them are struggling at any given point in time. And so there are situations involving people living in these kinds of uh, services, service programs that um, aren't always uh, ideal. And so um, critics will uh, shine a spotlight on those kinds of incidents as evidence that the whole thing doesn't work. Um, so uh, that's the end of my slides. I wanted to really breeze through that fast. Um, and I'll stop there and see if there are any questions. I'm sure I left out a whole ton of things. Thank you so much, Daniel. We don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, but please go ahead and enter them in if you have any, or you could let me know. Okay, we have a question from yeah. Bill about is housing first threatened at the national level? I think you partially addressed that, but do you wanna reflect a bit more, please? Yeah, it, it is definitely threatened at the national level. Um, I think there will be a move uh, in Congress, maybe in the new administration to uh, defund uh, uh, federal funding for housing first programs um, and uh, I think it's also under attack at the at the local level here and elsewhere with um, critics really working hard to try to discredit it. Um, it is, however, the most successful single intervention in homelessness policy that has ever existed. Um, that's indisputable, and there's a large body of research to support that. Thank you. Um, Charles asked if there's anything in particular about DESC that makes you successful. Um, well, uh, thank you for that. And um, I I would say the thing that makes us somewhat unique as an organization is that we are really focused on serving people who um, often get excluded from a variety of services and care options in the community. And so I think the thing that probably makes us successful is that we just have a great willingness to um, to serve this group of people who others might find undesirable. And along the way, I think that that makes us a somewhat uh, risk tolerant, uh, risk taking organization. And um, uh, that's probably the secret to our success is that we're willing to do certain things. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, Ken asked if there's any cost to participants. Uh, yeah, so in our housing, supportive housing side of things, uh, people pay rent. Um, that's the only cost that they have to pay. They pay rent based on their individual income. It's subsidized housing, so 30% of their adjusted gross income. Most people live on a disability income. Some people have no income. Most people have an income and you know, pay a couple hundred dollars a month in rent. And then we rely on other uh, contracts and sources to uh, help us cover the cost because the cost is much higher than what the individuals pay in rent. Thanks so much. And we can definitely thank you everyone for putting additional questions in the chat. We can definitely have some follow-up um, with those. I guess maybe we'll just close out by asking if there, someone asked if there's a flyer with contact info that we could give people to find resources such as through DESC. Yeah, let me uh, grab a couple of links and things and I'll, I'll start to put stuff in the chat with some of these questions. Great, thank you so much. Thanks so much, everybody, appreciate it. Okay, next up, I'm excited to introduce Aaron Davis. Erin Davis is a community health scientist, nationally certified health education specialist, and abolitionist who graduated with an MPH in epi epidemiology from the University of Washington. Erin believes strongly in the power of community and has a passion for public health research, community-led initiatives, and activism to address health disparities. 
Currently, Aaron leverages their diverse lived experience to inform their work and how they collaborate with communities. They work on many interdisciplinary projects such as a harm reductionist, mental health writer, racial health disparities researcher, and community program manager. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for that amazing introduction and thank you for having me here. Um, you know, as she mentioned, my name is Erin Davis and I'm a community health scientist and program manager that has been working with populations experiencing homelessness for about 10 years now in various capacities. Uh, my main role is I work for the Harm Reduction Research and Treatment Center, known as the Heart Center. Um, which is located in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the University of Washington. At the Heart Center, we work collaboratively with people who hold the lived experience of homelessness and who use substances, as well as the organizations that serve them to, or, excuse me, as well as the organizations that serve those populations to develop, conduct, evaluate, and disseminate evidence-based interventions that help to reduce harm, improve quality of life, and promote social justice and racial equity uh, for individuals and their communities. I also want to give a really quick huge shout out to Daniel Malone and DESC, my mentors and leaders of the Heart Center, Dr. Susan Collins and Seema Klifetsefi have collaborated with DESC for 17 years, uplifting the benefits of the Housing First model. And we all just really love this work. We love the collaboration and just really want to give a shout out to our one of our collaborating orgs. Um, today, I'm going to share about one of the projects under the Heart Center's umbrella that I help lead and manage the day-to-day -day operations for called the Doorway Project. Next slide, please. All right, so the Doorway Project was created in 2017 in response to a request for proposals to expand youth homelessness services in Seattle's University District. The Doorway Project is a Washington state funded initiative and partnership between the University of Washington and local service providers dedicated to helping young people experiencing homelessness in the area. And the primary aim of that project is to center the voices of youth and young adults in the area um, who are actively in homelessness in order to co-develop and evaluate a comprehensive and effective model of collaborative care and service to delivery that reduces youth homelessness and improves the quality of life for everyone impacted. We provide creative community and campus engagement opportunities for young folks we work with. And through those activities, we collaborate with young people to innovate solutions um, that create healing connection, lasting social change, and more inclusive supportive environments that they want to access. Next slide, please. So what is it that we actually do? So at the heart of the doorway's vision um, is a commitment to a holistic, integrated, and wraparound model of care. This approach is deeply grounded in the principles of healing-centered engagement, which is a framework developed by Sean Jenright that emphasizes the importance of people addressing the root causes of trauma while fostering res resilience and empowerment in young people. Under this framework, we are guided by five elements of radical healing, which include culture, agency, relationships, meaning, and achievement for the people we work with. Using this healing-centered approach to address trauma and assist people requires that we move beyond just asking, what happened to you, and toward the question, what is right with you? Viewing those exposed to trauma as agents in the creation of their own well-being rather than victims of traumatic events. So what does healing-centered engagement look like in practice? And how does that translate to our programming? I'll explain that on the next slide, please. All right, so at The Doorway, we've created three pillars of uh, programming as an outlet for our healing-centered engagement. And this includes uh, creative engagement opportunities such as our Healing Pages Book Club. Uh, we put on art and wellness events. Uh, we do UW campus engagements, uh, such as community-based internships, where we take on students and they work with us and our, our population of unhoused folks. And we also create co-learning opportunities for our participants to go onto campus and help co-teach classes or inform folks about their lived experience experiences or things that are important. Um, and lastly, uh, community engagements in the form of resource fairs, informal group networking with local partners, um, community trainings on topics like de-escalation and harm reduction, 
and our transition age youth support program, which I will highlight in greater detail on the next slide. All right, so the transition age youth or TAE program is really one of our main interventions at the Doorway Project. And in my opinion, one of the most impactful parts of the work we get to do. I personally have the privilege of creating all the curriculum for this program and facilitating it, which is just the joy of my work day. Um, the program, the TAE program is designed for young people who are close to aging out of youth homelessness services, which generally takes place around the client's age of 25, uh, 25 to 26 is pretty common. And those folks are at risk of entering the adult homeless service systems. And so really we work to try to disrupt this. We provide relevant resources, financial and community support and tools to help participants move towards stability uh, which can include housing, employment, and healing pathways. Our aim with the program is to help individuals self-define their goals, help them build skills, and help make community connections that are needed to achieve and maintain stability through curated opportunities centered around their individual healing needs. So I work with a cohort of eight young adults over the course of six months, and I meet with them individually, one-on-one, -on -one, every month to discuss their personal goals, their immediate needs, and sort of workshop pathways to make the goals realities. We hold bi-monthly cohort meetings where we all come together and we all take part in some form of creative or healing-based activities. We teach about the local resources that are really helpful for folks. Um, we invite in guest speakers uh, to hold relevant workshops and help participants build connections through the networking um, without them having to do the heavy lift. We bring all of the people to them directly. The young folks we work with are generally connected to a case manager, um, the outside agencies that we collaborate with as they enter the program. So what we do is we create a continuum of wraparound care and work alongside their existing caseworkers to help keep them engaged during the process of them trying to you know, figure out their housing and you know, whatever st stability supports they're looking for. Um, one huge standout of our program is we actually pay our participants an unconditional cash transfer of $1,000 per month over the course of the six months that we're running our program. And we find that this financial support works both as an incentive for folks to identify and work towards goals, but also it relieves a bit of stress and burden so they could focus on healing and growing in the ways they want to see for themselves, which is a huge, huge task for them. Um, the only accept, the only expectation for the program is that folks complete a monthly check-in with me um, and that they make an honest attempt to participate in the program activities that we offer. Uh, we also encourage them to stay open to supporting themselves and their peers and building community in a meaningful way with our cohort. Next slide, please. So we consider the TAE program to be something that is working very well. Uh, while still having space for growth and improvement, of course. I wanted to share some of the outcomes from our most recent cohort, which recently wrapped in June of this year. Uh, and in the incoming of this program, we had four individuals return for a second year. This is our, we're going into our third year of the program uh, starting in January. And so folks are usually involved over the course of two years in during the first year, this particular cohort had already worked through and achieved their housing uh, goals. So half of our cohort came in in some sort of uh, supportive or transitional subsidized housing. Um, and then two of them uh, also came in with some sort of you know, temporary or part-time employment situation. By the end of the programming year, um, all of our individuals who we were working with were housed stably. All were connected to independent financial opportunities, such as full-time employment or receiving disability benefits for those who were disabled and unable to work. We also saw participants complete their personal goals, which for some included milestones such as getting their GED, entering substance use disorder treatment, and traveling outside of the country for the first time. Most importantly, every single person felt more empowered and capable of identifying and achieving their goals moving forward. Next slide. So the final takeaway that I'd like to leave everyone with is that centering our solutions to address homelessness around healing-focused engagement 
and community collaboration works, particularly for our younger populations who are living unhoused. Providing wraparound care for individuals who are already seeing case managers and housing navigators is also an effective strategy to keep people engaged in the slow process of getting housed. Letting people determine and define their own goals helps to create more buy-in and increases the chances of individuals actually achieving those goals. Unconditional cash transfers, universal basic income, or whatever you'd like to call it, works. It really, really does. People need their immediate basic needs met to envision a, lar a longer term goal and a pathway out of homelessness, and the research tends to back this up. So lastly, the work that we do at the Doorway and in the TAE program is all scalable work. If programs and projects like these had more funding, more capacity, we can honestly assist more people rather than just a cohort of eight at a time and have larger cohorts and a larger or more positive, you know, greater impact on the Seattle area and beyond. I think this is a very effective, effective strength-based model. Um, and next slide, I believe that's all I have. Thank you so much for this space. Thank you so much for the work that uh, the coalition is doing and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for sharing your important work at Doorway, Erin. I'll keep an eye out for any questions in the chat. Um, but just to say, it was really inspiring to hear about the TAE program and how it really, it seems to bridge individual needs with community. Um, and that's a model I had not heard of before. Any questions? And I could also drop um, the Doorways website uh, into the chat just for folks who want to read a little bit more about what we do, see a little bit of the work. Um, yeah, and if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. That'd be great. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Charles. Um, do you have any trouble with funding um, the TAE program? Um, at this moment, no. So we um, are... The doorway programming, uh, the funding that we receive to do all of the programming that runs through that part of the project uh, is actually written into the state legislature. So we have a renewed amount that we get every two years, but it is very limited. And the amount that we have only really allows us the capacity to serve eight close you know, clients at a time in the TAG program. So while I wouldn't say we have trouble with funding, like we could serve eight people, it would be amazing to scale that up. And, you know, if there were means to increase the funding, uh, we would definitely have larger cohorts and possibly a year round model rather than six months, which is something that, you know, are the people that we work with. That's the number one feedback that we get is that they wish the program could last a full year rather than just six months because it takes you know longer than six months to to achieve your goals and to stabilize once you've been in house for a while. Great, thank you so much, Erin. Okay, if there aren't any more questions right now, I think we can move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Katie Wilson. Katie is a general is general secretary of the Transit Riders Union, a grassroots membership organization that fights to improve the quality of life for transit riders, renters, and workers across King County. She helps to coordinate the Stay House, Stay Healthy Coalition in a lines of over 50 organizations fighting for stronger renter protections in Seattle and King County. She has also been a freelance columnist, columnist for her local publications, including Crosscut, The Urbanist, Publicola, and The Stranger. So Katie, please take it away. Hi everyone, really glad to be here. Um, and thank you to the previous speakers. Um, it's really great to hear about all of the amazing work that's going on. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about renter protections, and I will um, try to share my screen here. Hopefully you can all see that. Um, so, yeah, as um, Anya mentioned, um, I helped to coordinate the Stay House, Stay Healthy Coalition, which has been 
um, as the slide says, fighting for stronger renter protections across King County. So when we think about homelessness and how people fall into homelessness, very, very often the event that precedes homelessness is an eviction. Um, and very, very often the reason for that eviction is not being able to pay rent. Um, and we, um, coming out of the pandemic, uh, as, as you are probably aware, rents began rising very rapidly all across King County. Um, the Stay House, Stay Healthy Coalition came together early in 2021. Um, this was when um, there were still some emergency protections in place. And the first thing that we did uh, was to fight for policies that would protect renters during the pandemic, especially local eviction moratoriums, other emergency protections. And in 2021, we were able to um, get some emergency protections, including moratoriums passed in Seattle, in Kenmore, in Kirkland, and in Burien. But at the same time, even as um, jurisdictions were trying to keep people housed during the pandemic, we knew that that wasn't gonna last forever. And we also knew that because there was, I think during the pandemic, an, an understanding of kind of the lopsided power relationship between landlords and tenants and the struggles that tenants were undergoing, there was kind of an opportunity to push for permanent runner protections. Um, and so we began to kind of turn our attention to that, even as we were also trying to extend the emergency measures um, that were in place during the pandemic. Um, so what, what could we do to protect renters? Unfortunately, um, we can't pass local rent control or rent regulation laws in Washington state because of a state law that was passed in the 1980s. Um, I think we'll be hearing shortly about some state level efforts to, to do something about that. But um, still, uh, locally, there are things that we can do to improve housing security and to help renters cope with large rent increases. So in 2021, the first big success we had on this front was uh, working through the King County Council. Um, and the King County Council, unfortunately, can't just pass renter protections for the entire county. Um, their kind of jurisdiction is unincorporated areas. So that includes a lot of rural King County, but also Skyway, White Center, Vashon. Um, and uh, the King County Council in July of 2021 passed um, a really good package of renter protections making sure that all renters um, are protected from eviction or lease termination without a, a just cause. Um, this is something that the state just cause law um, has kind of a loophole so that if you're on a year long or six month term lease, you're not protected. Um, they capped move-in fees at one month's rent and allowed renters to pay that in installments. So the really high upfront move-in costs of you know first month's rent, last month's rent and deposit is, is often a big barrier for tenants trying to find new housing. And so people end up staying in an apartment they can't afford because they can't afford to move or, you know, maybe end up staying in an unhealthy situation, whether that's, you know, a domestic violence situation or just, you know, an apartment with black mold and unlivable conditions because they can't afford the cost of moving. Um, so having that cap on moving costs and being able to pay in installments is really important. Um, they also cap late fees at 1.5% of someone's monthly rent. Um, we were seeing, you know, tenants being charged hundreds of dollars um, if their rent was five days late. Um, and uh, and they also increased the amount of notice that landlords had to give for a large rent increases. So for rent increases greater than 3%, landlords had to give 120 days notice instead of just the 60 days required by state law. Um, renters on fixed incomes had to be allowed to change their rent due date so that you didn't run into this problem of, you know, your rent is due on the first, but you don't get your, you know, social security or disability until later in the month. And then by that time you spent it on other things. Um, and then finally, they, they said that you don't need a social security number to apply for a rental home that can't be required. So um, that was some really good success. And then that same uh, year in 2021, we supported the passage of several new renter protection laws in the city of Seattle. One was bringing Seattle's just cause eviction law um, up to date, also closing that loose loophole for leases. Um, and then Seattle also passed what's called the EDRA program, Economic Displacement Relocation Assistance, 
um, that requires landlords who raise the rent more than 10%. If their tenant moves out because they can't afford that rent increase, they have to pay relocation assistance equal to three months rent. Um, and I'll just say, um, you know, it's interesting. We actually, the Transit Riders Union did a little survey of renters um, a couple of years ago to kind of see how this law was working um, in part. And um, one of the things we found is that the amount of the rent increase that people were getting was often hovering right under 10%. So that basically told us that this law changed landlord behavior. So there were landlords who maybe they would have raised the rent, you know, 15% or 20%, but because they didn't want to trigger this law, they were holding their rent increases just under 10%. So that's kind of a, I think I would say a positive side effect of that law. Um, and then finally, Seattle passed a law requiring six months notice of any rent increase. I will say as a renter myself on Capitol Hill in Seattle, um, I love this law because it's really nice to just have that um, that much time to kind of figure out, like, can I afford this rent increase or am I going to have to move, um, et cetera. Um, so that's what happened in 2021, uh, a really a really strong start. Um, and then the next year in 2022, we really worked on expanding this across King County. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to go through this chart in detail, but this just gives you a sense of like, there were five cities that year that passed some runner protections. And you know, there was some variation and, you know, lonely little Issaquah there that only did one little thing, but, you know, hey, they did something. Um, and, uh, you know, we learned a lot kind of working with uh, elected officials and renters and community organizations um, in all these different cities in, in trying to get their councils to pass things. So we're kind of, it's a very piecemeal project, but I think making, making some progress um, in a bunch of juris uh, different jurisdictions. Um, and then in 2023, um, CTAC and Shoreline also passed some of those same runner protections. Um, and then we made another step forward in Seattle. So Seattle um, had, had not yet capped late fees. Um, and in 2023, Seattle joined Auburn and Burien at capping late fees at $10 a month, which as far as we know is the highest standard in the, in the country, or the, the lowest standard in the country, I suppose you would say. Um, and then um, the other thing that Seattle did that year was ban what are called notice delivery fees. Um, these are um, arbitrary charges that basically whenever the landlord puts a notice on your door, whether that's a late fee notice or a lease violation notice or anything, um, they just slap on a fee like kind of for the act of putting the notice on your door. Um, and uh, so the Seattle bans this practice. Um, which is a first a good first step toward addressing uh, junk fees and rental problem, uh, rental housing, which is a, a growing problem, um, just as junk fees across the economy are a growing problem. Um, and then, you know, not to get too excited, uh, you know, we also, we're also, um, it's not all rainbows and butterflies, I guess. Um, so here in 2024, we've unfortunately been having to play defense. Um, and uh, the, the city of Kenmore was sued last year um, by a, an entity called the Washington Business Properties Association over several of its runner protections laws. And this, at least in my opinion, was basically a frivolous lawsuit. They didn't really think that they could win, but they were very clearly trying to send this is kind of a property rights group. Um, and they were very clearly trying to send a message to small cities um, to stop doing this stuff. Uh, and basically by suing Kenmore, which is a very small city, they were saying, you're going to get sued. Um, Kenmore ultimately settled that lawsuit. And part of the settlement was repealing a couple of their protections, the, the piece of their law, which extended just cause to leases. Um, and then another little piece that I'm not going to go into because it's a little complicated. I don't have a lot of time. Um, so that was unfortunate. And, you know, we had been working really hard in Tequila to pass rent protections. And unfortunately, I think that lawsuit really scared Tequila um, City Council. So that also has kind of come to a standstill. Um, and then, as you're probably aware, we have a Seattle City Council right now that's not exactly um, uh, a champion for, for renters. And so we're expecting next year that there are going to be some bad proposals coming down for weakening Seattle's runner protection laws. And we're worried about the same thing in Burien because their council also is, is not particularly pro renter. Um, so, you know, I think the message here is just, we made a lot of progress and, you know, two steps forward, one step back, we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep going. Um, but, uh, you know, this is, this is just the reality of, of politics when you're, um, when you're fighting against powerful interests and the, you know, the rental housing association and, other landlord and um, uh, kind of real estate lobby groups fight this everywhere we do it. They're always very vocal, very 
um, very active. Um, but I will say that like in terms of moving forward, we have lots more ideas. So um, it would be great to ban or regulate more kinds of junk fees, um, ban algorithmic rental price setting, um, which is uh, an issue that you might have heard about in the last few years. There's some lawsuits going on about how landlords essentially are colluding to fix prices through these kind of third party services like RealPage. Um, and, uh, you know, you could have a portable screening and credit checks so people aren't having to pay every time they apply for a new apartment. Um, you could also just ban credit checks, which is something that's been considered in a couple other cities. So um, that's kind of it. And um, then the big question, which uh, hopefully sets us up for the next speaker, is when will Washington State pass rent stabilization? Because um, that's something that I think would... Um, it would not make all of these protections that we're passing locally obsolete by any means, um, but it would uh, it would really help. So I'll stop there and happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie, for sharing about your work. We do already have one question from Peter, which is how is the availability of rental housing in King County, if you're able to answer that? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there is there is a huge gap between the need for affordable rental housing and what exists at basically almost every income level. Um, I don't have the numbers in front of me, so I can't quote them to you. But, you know, many, many, many thousands of units are needed for people at zero to 30 percent AMI, 30 to 50 percent, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so there is just a huge shortage of affordable housing, which is why we've seen these large rent increases in part, because there's just been a big mismatch between kind of the supply of rental housing and the demand, especially as you have, um, you know, high paid tech workers moving into the regions for jobs. Um, and we just have these kind of um, outdated zoning laws that prevent uh, multifamily housing from being built in large, large swaths of, of Seattle and King County. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we have a question from Vicki. Are there any talking points or resources that progressive groups can use when speaking with state legislators about rent stabilization? Yeah, and I'm sure that we'll get into this um, with um, the next speaker. But um, yeah, I mean, I know that the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance has done is um, has done a lot of the kind of like coordinating of, you know, organizations and individuals um, for renter protection work in Olympia, including um, on rent stabilization. And I think they will have um, I think they have, you know, regular meetings that people are welcome to join and will be producing lots of talking points and, and other materials that people can use for that, for sure. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions right now, but please feel free to put them in the chat and maybe Katie can answer them there. Um, okay, we'll take one last question. <laughs> um, I wonder which organizations tend to organize against your work? Do real estate lobbyists? Uh, yes. So, I mean, the, the ones that are often the most active are the landlord lobby groups. So that would be the Rental Housing Association and the Multifamily Housing Association. Um, the real estate groups also have been somewhat active. Um, I'm, I don't remember offhand all the names of them, but I, like when we were doing work in Kenmore, for example, I know that some of the real estate groups were like sending, you know, emails and letters to the council members and telling them that the sky was going to fall if they did this stuff and they would, you know, it would never pencil out to be able to build a housing project again and all this kind of scare tactics stuff that was just absolutely untrue. But yeah, so the real estate lobby is also active in addition um, in addition to the, the landlords. Thanks, Charles, for that question. Okay, well, thank you so much, Katie. We can move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Senator, Senator Yasmin Trudeau. She represents Washington's 27th legislative district, which includes Tacoma, Ruston, Browns Point, Dash Point, and Fife. 
She currently serves as vice chair of the Law and Justice Committee and is a member of the Environment, Energy, and Technology Committee and Housing Committee. She is also one of the two Senate Democrats negotiating the capital budget. Additionally, she serves as chair of the Senate Members of Color Caucus. Yasmin was appointed to the Senate in 2021 and won election to full term in 2022. She is the first woman of color to serve as senator for the 27th Legislative District. Her motivation for inclusive, equitable public policy comes from her professional and lived experiences. Before her role as state senator, she was the legislative and tribal affairs director for the Washington Attorney General's Office, collaborating with agencies, legislators, and community partners to pass legislation addressing student loan supports, prohibiting youth solitary confinement, and strengthening Medicaid fraud enforcement, among others. She has also served as Senate Democratic Caucus staff and legislative assistant to then state senator and now Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal. Yasmin was born into poverty and violence, spent time in the foster care system, and faced housing insecurity throughout her youth and early adulthood. This has given her a deep perspective on the challenges that many of our most vulnerable community members face every day and has provided knowledge about the state system's responses. Therefore, she centers equity and works to ensure that people are always prioritized over politics and profit. When Yasmin is not performing Senate duties, she serves as the manager of the Washington Attorney General's Race Equity Unit and spends time with her husband, two young children, their cat Jinx, and her robust plant collection. So with that, I would love to hand it over to you, Senator Trudeau. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Um, I did not uh, sub I did not provide that robust biography. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> I have got big shoes to fill and you read all that on paper. Um, I'm Yasmin Trudeau uh, here with you in this Zoom room from Tacoma, Washington, where I live with my two kids. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old, so you might hear some of that chaos, um, but I think we're pretty used to Zoom by now. Uh, just someone give me a signal if there ends up being chaos that interferes with the conversation and I can figure out when to appropriately mute, um, especially during question and answer. I You heard a little bit about the committees I serve on. I'll just start by saying you know, one of the things that I really think about and, and struggle with is the way that the legislature silos sort of committee jurisdiction or issues. Because I really think that when you think about the whole person, and since I'm in a room full of people that really care for whole people, um, it's really difficult sometimes to parse out where, where certain solutions lie on really complex problems. And so the Law and Justice Committee, which I serve as vice chair, is arguably the well, it is the most packed committee of the entire legislature. And I refer to that as the symptoms committee. Um, I also serve on the housing committee, which until recently really didn't have a lot of bills and still doesn't match nearly the same bill level as the symptom, the quote unquote symptom committee as I refer to it. And I think part of that, oh, I look really big on my screen. Let me change my own view because that's a little bit daunting. Okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> so my face come at me really quickly. Um, but I think about that as like the foundational supports committee, right? Because I think I'm, and as you heard from my very robust bio, uh, part of what I believe in is that if you invest in people, you will actually need to spend less later on things like symptoms. And so housing for me is one of those foundational supports because I have experienced housing insecurity and homelessness in really formative years. And I had a lot of people that extended a helping hand and really supported and guided me through that. And I say this to you because when I was approached about the issue of rent stabilization, um, I had just joined the legislature and I had come off of moving my own mom and brother, who are both disabled, uh, four times in three years because of rent increases. And so, in fact, the housing issues that the community was already facing, that conversation had already been bubbled up. And I think I, I appreciate I'm now Miss Is It Katie that was presenting before me. Um, talking about the Washington Low Income Housing Alliance, they have really been leading the fight on the organizing effort on rent stabilization. But when I came into the legislature, it was sort of that prime opportunity where I said, you know, maybe this is a chance again where I can use some of my lived experience to move an issue that has been really difficult to talk about. And Katie set it up perfectly. I'll kind of start, I'll start where I almost planned to end with my talking points because I think it dovetails off what Katie offered. And that is that the representation in the legislature has been predominantly by people who are landlords themselves, right? So it actually starts there because that has been a, a form of wealth building. And so when it's a when you have something that's a form of wealth building and you have a profession that has really been exclusive for the most part and stays that way, in my opinion, given that we sort of treat this still as part-time work, 
you can only afford to do it if you are able to work another job or if you are independently wealthy or have your own business. So if you think about who's been in the room, that's been a protected interest for a really long time. And then you have the rental housing and other landlord lobby groups that have filled that void and really worked hard to make laws like preempting local governments from stabilizing using their own stabilization efforts. And then most, you know, recently you have the realtors who have been really the funders and the backers of the, um, the no initiatives on some of the local tenant protections. They're not the ones that are necessarily out there lobbying against rent stabilization or other tenant protections, but they're funding that lobby. Um, I've had since some, some good conversations with them about um, the path on rent stabilization because that will be back this year and it will be my number one priority in terms of policy. Um, as and it's going to be a top priority for both the House and the Senate. Um, but the other the other folks that have entered the chat are the developers. And so one of the things that comes up consistently is supply. I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about rent stabilization, too, but I think it's it's good to kind of have the whole picture of what's going on right now. It's the issue of supply. So a couple of years ago, I think the legislature was like, OK, we have a housing crisis. And the immediate, and I think the easiest sort of low-hanging fruit is you think about housing supply. I think demand, supply and demand is real. There are real constraints on the market, and we have had constraints on supply. So we worked on, you know, the zoning ordinances. I was the um, Senate sponsor of the mid missing middle so that we could ensure that, you know, local jurisdictions weren't exclusively zoning for single-family homes, which was constraining the housing market. It was constraining what it costs for developers to build, and it was constraining in terms of who could get into home ownership, whether seniors could age in place, are there housing options available? So we started this housing supply conversation, and immediately what struck me was is that stabilization and tenant protections were now being wielded as a weapon against housing supply and development. And to me, I just think that we can chew gum and walk. I think we've got two hands for a reason. I Again, I sponsored the middle housing bill. I also then sponsored the transit-oriented development bill. And through the work of the capital budget, have, we have over the last biennium now had over $523 million in affordable housing development injected across the state. So I have no problem with supply. But I have had a real problem with what's happening with this issue because the reality is we can never build enough supply for the amount of people that are going to want to live in this state. Whether that is now because of the political climate, whether that is in the here, near future, and future on the actual climate, we are a wonderful place to live and a lot of businesses and people are moving here. So the idea that somehow we're going to be able to correct and supply while also protecting our environment, while also <laughs> um, taking into consideration all of the other things like infrastructure, we can't build fast enough to solve for this problem. So to me, you have to be able to stabilize because it's shocking to me that we can we forget when we demonize homelessness that many folks with evictions can actually never get rehoused. And if you're working in a constrained housing market, it is very it's even less likely that you can rehouse someone once they are on the brink of homelessness. And the statistics I have, which some of you might know, which was just glaring to me, especially when I was talking to some of my colleagues across the aisle, especially in rural parts of the state, is that. I think it was so for every 10% uh, increase, it was at $100, or excuse, excuse me, $100 increase in rent was a 10% increase in homelessness, correlation, not causation, obviously. Um, and then that same $100 increase in a rural area was a 38% uptick, right? That does have to do with housing supply. But the problem is you have to stop the bleed and you have to build so that people then have a place to go. So there's two things that need to happen. So I'm giving you this full picture of housing because I actually, in addition to saying we're good, we are working on rent stabilization, I would love continued partnership and support because I think a group like this absolutely gets that we cannot have people on the brink of homelessness and expect them to be healthy and whole people. We cannot expect people on the street <laughs> to ever be stabilized enough to like hope and dream about anything except for survival. And that actually, I, you know, it, it changes the way people behave. It actually starts to impact the brain when folks are unhoused for long periods of time. And we're seeing that now in efforts to rehouse, which is why a lot of the, the, the low income um, housing authorities are having real problems. Um, people aren't using stoves properly, ovens properly. I mean, there's really a lot of consequences. I don't need to go on and on about this group, but I tell you because I think now we're in a different sort of situation where 
we have tension around something like transit oriented development, which is our last major supply policy. It could inject a ton of housing supply. And the fight is over 10% of those units remaining affordable. 10%, it's gonna unlock development across the state. Developers are gonna make a lot of money, but there are that we're fighting right now about 10%. That's the reason my bill didn't progress forward last year. It just came to an absolute standstill. And my worry is that now we're being pitted to say, do you want this short-term solution to forego long-term affordability? And I just don't think that that's a, a conversation that we should be having. And so I bring that to you all to grapple with as we continue to talk about the entire housing continuum. But I'm going to keep pushing for rent stabilization, and I'd love to just pause there and be able to answer any questions that folks might have. I don't even know how long I've been talking, so you know, if you need to give me a bat signal, I can stop. No, that was wonderful. Thank you, Senator Trudeau. Yeah, everyone, please just enter your questions into the chat. Maybe I spoke so much. I just left everybody. No questions. Very thorough presentation. <laughs> you can ask me anything. Okay, we have a an, uh, question from oh. Bill. Does your effort on rent stabilization apply in rural counties as well? Yes, yeah, so it would be statewide. So it would apply everywhere. And actually, we... Katie talked a little bit about some of the local initiatives. I think what's what's interesting is that the local initiatives have really pushed a conversation on the state level supportive towards rent stabilization, because I think what the landlord community, and I understand that's also not a monolith, and I do not want to paint everyone with the broad terms for a moment. I think that the landlord community recognizes that it's actually not good for the market to have different jurisdictions. It's not good for them either to track all the different rules in different jurisdictions. So the idea is, is that folks would want more of a statewide solution because that um, that we have the ability to do that. Now, the other, the other thing, the, the counterpoint that some folks have wanted is like you just lift the preemption, right? So if you lift the preemption, you can have locals all doing it, but then you might have different areas that that might be easier or not, right? Is Seattle an area where um, it might be easier than, I don't know, uh, Kennewick? And so I think if you have something, it's not going to be the strongest thing that could apply in every jurisdiction, but it's some uniformity and some stability across the state. So if someone moves from Kennewick to Seattle, they are also at least subject to the, you know, the same law. Thank you. Okay, question from Katie. Could you tell us more about the rent stabilization policy you're hoping to put forward and whether any other renter protections will be included in the same bill? Yeah, absolutely. So here, I'll tell you kind of what's in it on a high level interview or overview. A couple of things have changed as it went as the House bill went through the process. And don't quote me on everything because there might be some edits and adjustments when we introduce the new bill. But in sort of broad strokes, it restricts rent increases once per 12 month period. So this is where I get to tell everyone it is not rent control. It does not set the price of rent. It's when somebody is already in a tenant relationship within that 12 month period. You cannot in increase the rent more than once and more than 7% for all lease types. That's what's in the bill now. Um, it also, uh, it says equal charges for month to month and long-term leases so that people can't mess with that. I had a situation where I didn't know my mom had been persuaded to move to a month to month and we got a 20 day notice to move uh, two disabled folks out of a um, two bedroom house. So really wanted to address some of these things in terms of applying protections um, in both areas. Uh, it does have, it requires a 100-day notice for um, over, was well, started at 3%, 5% rent increases. Um, it has notice requirements, so specific format that folks have to be able to use um, to let folks know about rent increases, including whether they're applying for an exemption. That's changed a little bit. We're not working with, with landlords to, to do the exemption process, but there's going to be something around that. Uh, the other thing that I would want to point out about it is that the developers are often and, and the realtors will say it's stifling the housing market. Well, in the bill, it has a 10 year exemption for new builds. Um, and when we looked at what housing markets and what developers were looking at in terms of the um, return on investment, they weren't looking out beyond 10 years. 
So again, these are things to make sure that we aren't stifling supply and that we can have new buildings that don't feel the constraint. There could be a return on investment and then those then turn into um, affordable, um, or not affordable, but units that this, this uh, restriction would apply. But I think the overall thing that I'd say is it's really about like prohibiting rent gouging. So at least there's like the predictability. So right now you don't have people that I've heard from in my community that are, you know, 70% in two years, their rent has gone. It's just absolutely bonkers. Um, fair charges, help with fees. Um, and if you if your rent gets hiked, making sure that you have notice and just making sure that everyone follows the rules. <laughs> it's, it's pretty, pretty straightforward. I, I, I kind of chuckle when I say that because everyone talks about this bill like there's so much more in it. Um, and there's not. There is attorney general enforcement, which I think is the real boogeyman, um, to be quite honest. And that is because if uh, the attorney general gets to enforce the RLTA, that changes the game for the RLTA and the entire industry will have to change its behavior. At least that's what I predict will happen. Um, but that's never the thing that folks are going to tell you that they're most concerned about. Thank you. Erin asked, how can we help uplift or advocate for rent stabilization to move forward? I mean, you all are physicians for social responsibility. I mean, who do I, who who can't be listening to doctors? Like, let's <laughs> just say uh, you all are a powerful, like powerful force. I mean, it's like when I talk to the grandmothers against gun violence, like, who wants to run or who are who in their right mind would argue with the grandma about guns? Um, so I think, you know, in many ways, you all are primed as as folks that are not um you know, necessarily benefactors of this legislation, but you understand the impact on the people that you serve and you think it's important because of that. And I think that that's just such an incredible gift to these types of conversations because, you know, unfortunately, we are not in a place where lived experience is as valued. And I do often, you know, people come in and they tell their stories and people get fatigued, but I think legislators speak up when certain groups speak up and I would say thank you for doing that. So when you walk into a room and you say rent stabilization is a priority for us, that's as, as much as I could ask you to do. But I'm happy to loop you into, you know, low income housing alliance lobby days, you know, all that stuff, but you know where to find those things. Thank you. Okay, another question from Ayana. My community asks me more and more for eviction attorney recommendations and she's an attorney. Do you have any suggestions for where lower income people can go for eviction help, especially seniors and those with disabilities? Absolutely. So the Northwest Justice Project um, is a really great resource. You know, they are constantly uh, bombarded. I mean, this, this issue is something that they're facing. And I think with the right to counsel, there's a lot of demand. Um, and so I, that's, you're, you're feeling that. There's a lot of demand. They're trying to get more pro bono attorneys. Another flag, I think, is that my concern is that there will be, as we move into some very difficult budget years and conversations ahead, um, exacerbated by what's happening on the federal level, um, given our policy positions and, and things that we've taken on in this state. Um, I think that we, I think that we often will look at losing things like right to counsel where it's not enshrined, you know, it's not a constitutional right. It costs money. The state is contributing. It's fairly new. My concern is that that's in it. And we are seeing a situation in King County that I think is the a misguided problem statement that could actually be better fixed with more resources at the court level to ensure that there's a, you know, that you don't have backlogs in cases. And right now the attorneys and the backlog in attorneys is actually getting blamed. And so I'm just worried that they're gonna kind of throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I say that not that that answers your question fully. Um, the short answer was Northwest Justice Project or the Office of Civil Legal Aid. But I think that the right to counsel and um, attorneys supporting low-income tenants is also something that we should watch very closely. I'm really concerned about that as we move into the budget cycle. Okay, we'll take one last question. I heard at a recent coffee meetup with a legislator that rent stabilization equals rent control, which they said we don't want, and that we need more apartments to create less demand. They also said that developers would be scared away. I thought that this was a way of ignoring the problem of affordability. How does one speak to this idea of solving the problem with more housing? 
Absolutely. So boy, you just had a meeting with all three of the main talking points. I told you they were <laughs> going to give you. That's good. Uh, I feel like I'm on my A game walking into session. Um, you know, I think what are you what are you going to do as folks are being forced into homelessness? What what how is how is one how can you solve for one and not the other? I mean, I agree housing supply, but this idea again that we are somehow going to constrain supply with exemptions in the bill that look at the way investors actually do development that focuses on rent stabilizing efforts within a 12 month period. I've seen every study across the country on rent control. I actually think there are major flaws in traditional rent control. I wouldn't say that they're completely um, they couldn't work, but if you look at like San Francisco, we're talking about boards and like ways to actually set rent prices and keep rent prices locked in. You also see that where where like San Francisco imposed their rent control board, they did that at a time actually where they were restricting supply. So they were actually in their super NIMBY phase at that time. So unlike Washington state that is working on injecting supply through, I mean, we have so much incentive for supply right now. It is ridiculous. That's why I point out that even the 10% set aside, which I've talked to affordable housing developers is absolutely reasonable to do. We're fighting about it. Because if you can keep saying our problem's getting bigger by this other thing, you can keep getting more. <laughs> is the bottom line. And that's what I see that's happening. Um, so I think that the answer is we can't let folks, we can't build our way out of this problem and we can't let people just be pushed out onto the streets um, in droves while we figure it out. That's just, yeah, that's not responsible. Okay, thank you so much, Senator Trudeau. I think thank we'll you. end the Q&A there. But just, yeah, really, thank you for that message that we can do both and challenging that narrative that it has to be one or the other, because I hear that all the time. Um, and just thank you for your tireless work of supporting those in, in the community, especially those experiencing housing insecurity. So Absolutely. thank you for being here with us. Well, thanks for being in the fight. And I look forward to seeing some of you in Olympia. <laughs> I do know to listen to the physicians. <laughs> so, I'll see you down there. Thank you so much. Okay, with that, I will hand it over to Gleb for our closeout. All right. Let's get those slides up. All right. Hi, everyone. So as we wrap up this event, we wanted to briefly put on your radar what you can do to get involved with WPSR and some action items that you can take today to support housing for all. As Lexi mentioned, in addition to housing, our three volunteer task forces focus on nuclear weapons abolition, economic inequity, and climate. My name is Gleb. I use he, him pronouns, and I'm a third year medical student in Olympia, Washington. And I'm personally involved with WPSR's economic inequity and health task force. Uh, next slide. So our task force's specific vision is essentially a world where all Washingtonians have enough money, all Washingtonians are housed, and structural racism no longer creates health inequities. Next slide. And then what our specific task force does, we like to take action to provide a consistent health perspective to pass social justice policies that improve health, build our community and change social narratives about root causes of health inequities, and deepen our understanding of economic and racial equity, health justice, and advocacy strategies. All right, so we have two actions that I want everyone watching to take right now. So that QR code, and I'll also I'll add the link here. Oh, perfect. Uh, Lexi just posted in the chat, but this QR code will take you to a page on our website that will give you the opportunity to send two letters. One to urge lawmakers to pass rent stabilization in 2025, and another to urge lawmakers to fund affordable housing and homelessness services in 2025. All you have to do on that website is to provide your name, address, and email, and our site will take care of the rest. You can edit the letter um, as you see fit, but it's already generated with a lot of talking points and data that we uh, provide for you. Um, so go ahead and take a moment to open that link up. And then we'll also, uh, yeah, we have it in the chat as well. And yeah, if anyone has any questions on how the letters work, um, just let us know.
Um, I think we could probably move on. So, and with that, we just want to thank you all for attending tonight. Another huge thanks to our incredible panelists this evening. Um, like I said before, those two actions um, you can take right now can help support the work of our panelists. Um, so if you can, please sign up for our action alerts and consider becoming a WP WPSR, <clears throat> excuse me, WPSR member and joining one of our task forces. Um, we'll keep sending you info on other advocacy opportunities as well as other ways you can get involved with uh, not, not only our task force, but the other task forces that focus on those other issues we discussed. Um, and please, 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 um, if you can, send that link um, to any of your colleagues, your networks, um, just so we can get as many voices out there supporting um, this work for housing. And uh, with that, yeah, thank you so much to everyone. Um, yeah, we'll keep this page up if you need those links. But otherwise, um, thank you so much for coming. We'll give you guys seven minutes back of your time.